Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. During and after World War II, there were approximately 436,000 prisoners detained in the United States, and thousands of those were detained in POW camps right here in Wyoming. There were two main camps, one in Douglas and one at Fort Effie Warren, and there were 17 other branch camps dispersed throughout the state. Wyoming author Cheryl O'Brien has done the research and we'll visit with her about her new book next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. It is our pleasure to be joined on Wyoming Chronicle by Wyoming author Cheryl O'Brien. Cheryl, welcome. You've written a book about a part of Wyoming's history that I think is largely forgotten, and I'm talking about World War II POW camps within the borders of Wyoming. Before we really get into that though, Cheryl, let's talk about you, your history. Tell us where you grew up and how you ended up here in Dubois. Well, thank you, Craig. I'm happy to be here with you today. I grew up in upstate New York and uh, in the Hudson Valley area. And I worked for a state agency for over 20 years, which included wildlife management work and review of projects that involved mitigation of environmental impacts. So my work involved a lot of technical writing, including developing industry manuals that dealt with pollution prevention controls. So real boring writing you, compared to what you've written about here. Exactly, important, uh, but yes. not the most interesting sure. for many. Sure. And I also wrote articles on environmental topics, um, such as waterfowl identification, sure. women hunting, fly fishing. And I enjoy both reading and writing, and I'm an avid reader, and I'm fortunate that I'm a speed reader. I wish I had that superpower, Cheryl. I can't tell you. Yeah. Well, it's actually, I guess it's inherited. My grandmother and mother were speed readers, and my daughter is a speed reader. And it's been very, very helpful in my research for this project. You know, I can skim a page in as fast as I and I'll kind of process it as I turn the page. And that's really helped me get through um, extensive research documents sure. to locate the information that I need. About 18 years ago, you went back to school. I did. We moved um, to Wyoming about 18 years ago. And, and then shortly after, I went back to school and I graduated from the University of Wyoming and where I focused on uh, courses in history and archeology. span And I'm very interested in local history. And I've conducted research on several local history topics, such as um, old post offices and early roads in the upper Wind River Valley where we live. You actually um, found the Dubois branch camp site and wrote about that in the Annals of Wyoming History, is that correct? Right, the site had already been found and, and documented, but there was very little information about that site. Um, so several years ago, I was researching um, early post offices up in the Dunor Valley, and I interviewed a man, um, Kip McMillan, um, who had been to the German POW campsite as a young boy, and his grandfather, Richter Van Mietri, was president of the Wyoming Tie and Timber Company. And the Wyoming Tie and Timber Company was responsible for establishing Camp Dubois. But because of the labor shortage, um, they needed prisoner labor to cut the timber, which was used mainly to make railroad ties, which was very important during the war. Sure. I had been to that site. Um, several times uh, with longtime residents, and I was fascinated by the information that Kip provided about details of being at the camp. And your father also served in World War II. He did. Uh, he was a farm boy, and uh, at 19, he served in the U.S. Army Air Forces, and he, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, he was sent to Hawaii for training, and then he ended up in the Philippines and Marshall Islands. So, Cheryl, when did you first understand that, you know what, there, it wasn't just this camp in Dubois. There were 17 other branch camps and two other main camps in Wyoming. When did that 
When did that dawn on you, that there was a lot of history here that really hadn't been told? Well, I had spent quite a bit of time doing my research on Camp Dubois, actually probably two and a half years or so. And, I, and when I was doing that, I realized that there was so little information on the other camps. And a lot of people were even saying to me, you should do the other camps, you know, in Wyoming too. And eventually I realized that, yeah, I really should do the other camps because there was limited information on those also. So I, um, my husband and I spent the better part of the last three years um, you know, traveling across Wyoming. Let, let's talk about your research. Okay. Was it hard to the extent that, you know, none of us have read much about um, these camps that were all over the state? Was, was it hard for you to, to do this research? Or was it a matter of just connecting with people and understanding stories? It was hard in the beginning to get started. Um, some of the camps, we knew where they were. Some of them that were at um, some of the armories and some of the uh, state, some of the fairgrounds we could find. But some of the camps were difficult to locate. So once we knew what community they were in, we'd go to the community and try to, we'd work with museums and, and local libraries, senior centers, and find people who had memories to share and knew where the camps were. And so we would interview people and um, they would share their memories with us. And we would also go through local records and try to get more information, in particular the <coughs> newspapers. The newspapers provided a wonderful chronological record of the establishment of the camps. So we'd start, um, you know, we'd wear our white gloves and we'd go down in the basements of the old newspaper offices. And we'd start in 1943, because that's when the first camps were established in Wyoming. And we'd go through the newspaper articles into 1946 when the last camps um, closed. Take us back, Cheryl, to the, the need to have camps across the country. There were thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of prisoners that were detained all over the United States. How were those camps organized and who thought to do it all over the country? Okay. Give us that history. The camps were uh, organized by service command, by the U.S. Army, and um, the camps jurisdiction crossed state lines. So Wyoming was part of the 7th Service Command, as was Colorado and Nebraska. So the camps in this area um, were run by the 7th Service Command. And the reason the prisoners were in the United States is, like you said, prisoners were being collected by the thousands um, in Europe, and they didn't have room for them. And so at the request of uh, Great Britain and other countries, the United States agreed to have prisoners also put here in the United States. All 50 states, or just the continental 48 states, have camps within their borders? Most of the states did. You know, we didn't have Alaska and Hawaii at that time. Um, and I, it, most of the states did have camps. There were restrictions on how close they could be to major shipping areas and major cities, uh, but the majority of the states had prisoner war camps. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about newspaper accounts of how this progressed in Wyoming, and you write about them in detail in your book, and I found them to be fascinating. So I can't imagine in Douglas what it would have been like to, here comes the train, and here comes the American soldiers that are going to build this camp that can support maybe up to 3,000 mm -hmm. prisoners and what that must have felt like for the town. And you talk about the newspaper accounts. For the, uh, the locals showed up. They, they lined the streets. This was like a parade. It was. And, and they, they watched uh, the guards come in first, of course, and then as the different groups of prisoners came in. And there was very good newspaper coverage of the camps, especially in the beginning when they were first being uh, planned, built, um, and the prisoners came in. And then that last year, though, or so, we found less newspaper accounts. You know, the war had w was ending and had ended, right. and so you'd see less information about the prisoner war camps and more about our, our guys coming home. What kind of feeling did you get about whether there was animosity initially towards locating prisoners of war? These Axis prisoners were fighting our boys. They were fighting us, and yet now here they are in our community, how, how did that go, go over and how was that received? I think in the beginning there, there was some an anxious feelings, you know, for sure. This was, this was new uh, to us. 
and then as the war progressed and the prisoners were here longer, um, the security and some of the hype, you know, settled down, and it was more accepted. And actually, the uh, camp, the residents in these communities needed the prisoner of war labor. They to sure did, and and that was fascinating to me. Um, the farmers needed yeah, yeah. the prisoners' help to harvest crops. They did um, most. Most of the men were gone serving, and um, they did have uh, students and women working in the fields. A lot of the towns released uh, high school students to, to work in the fields, but they still needed uh, the labor. To, back then, you know, agriculture was very labor intensive, and they needed them to maintain and harvest the crops, the sugar beets and the potatoes and other crops. So how, from your research, did the prisoners react? I. <laughs> They had just been captured. They had been brought to the United States. They're placed in Wyoming. Um, your book painted a surprising picture for me mm -hmm. that for many it was okay yeah. that they were here. And I think for many of them it may have even been relief that they, that they had food <laughs> to eat and that they were had, you know, places to sleep, you know. The casualties increased, you know, tremendously as the war progressed and our, you know the right the fighting was tough and he, yes I'm sure that they were apprehensive about coming here but once they saw what the good treatment that they had and that they were going to be treated fairly uh, they worked hard. I want to give our viewers a sense of what they felt about Wyoming and this is part of a poem that you recount in your book written by a um, prisoner of war who was um, in Basin at mm -hmm. the time is where he was and he writes this about Wyoming, Im immense, immeasurably great this land, white, white peaks afar jut upward to the sky, where clouds tear loose from them, from summits grand, and their dark shadows wander the throngs of high, bleak, empty hills of men completely free, as broad, as lonely as the distant sea. It strikes me that they did appreciate that they were here in our state. I think you're right, and through several interviews, uh, the prisoners indicated that they felt more free here in the camps than they did elsewhere. Let's talk about the daily life of, of the camp, and then we'll get into a, a little bit about where these camps were around Wyoming. Um, there were Italian prisoners, and there were yeah. German prisoners, and, and many other nationalities. And other nationalities, yeah. too, but after a while, that didn't necessarily mix too well. It didn't. In, in, in the beginning, uh, most of the prisoners were Italian prisoners um, that were captured. And then the prisoner status changed, uh, September 43, I believe it was. And they became non-combatants and they were, a, they were allowed privileges of um, working in jobs that the other prisoners couldn't work at. They had more freedom. and. Um, the situation changed, Ger more German prisoners and other nationalities were brought into the camps after that point. There was friction in these prisoner of war camps, even in Wyoming. Including the Wyoming camps. And, and we talked about um, a little earlier, I think we talked about Fort Warren, where the Italian and German prisoners were both there. Um, they were separated, but there were definitely uh, friction between the two groups. And, and in Ryan Park, when later on when the German prisoners came in and the Austrian prisoners were also um, housed there, there was friction between those groups too because of their um, differences in political ideologies and, within and backgrounds. These, within these camps, Cheryl, did, did the prisoners kind of um, negotiate their own leadership from within the camp? How did that process work? Was there some organization on the prisoners and about how their camps would run? In the, in the larger camps, there, uh, the camps were mainly organized um, by the prisoners, um, by the German prisoners in particular I'm thinking about, with, um, with the, some of the German real pro-Nazi um, prisoners being in charge um, and, and running things in the camp. And in a way, that made the camps run very efficiently, but in the other way, um, it was difficult for the prisoners that were not extreme pro-Nazi um, POWs because those prisoners were often targeted and harassed to the point that 
um, some of the prisoners actually put in for transfers to other camp or were happy to serve in the branch camps to get away from that. Were there, there were fights and altercations then? There were, and, and specifically, um, when you're thinking of altercations, the one, the one reported in Ryan Park where they actually had riots between, this was between the Austrian and other German prisoners, <clears throat> and in some of the other camps where the, um, some of the pro, real pro-Nazi POWs um, actually beat up um, some of the prisoners who were not as p politically inclined. The Geneva Convention, drove how these camps were operated the, from the Americans' perspective. What did that mean? So that meant that the prisoners did have certain rights. Um, they, couldn't, they couldn't be expected to perform duties that were hazardous to their health. Um, the hours that they worked were specified. Um, they, uh, they were housed in a manner that was um, equivalent to the, how our guards and American the, military The American personnel. military, yeah. We're Which housed. was surprising to me <laughs> that they were almost treated as equals relative to their housing and, yes. and their, their, their daily life in. And, and their rations, mm -hmm. even though it didn't have to be the same food, it had to be equivalent um, type of food that they were provided with. Some of the reports um, from the prisoners, you know, that were interviewed after the war or even during the war, they acknowledge the good treatment that they were uh, provided with while they were here. They were called prisoners of wars and they also were called PWs. Yeah, that was very common. Actually, most of the newspaper articles and the military records and diaries, um, they are referred to as PWs, yes. You recount a story of some Douglas High Schoolers who thought it would be a good idea <laughs> to wear PWs. It was a fad. On their, their sweatshirts or their things as they went to school. And they got a little stern warning, I think. And, it, and that was reported in the Douglas newspaper, but that, that happened, you know, across the United States as well as Wyoming. The warning was is that not a good idea. You could be shot. Right, especially if you didn't halt <laughs> when you were told to. <laughs> I'm not sure why you, you um, um, would want to do that. You did say, Cheryl, the work could not be dangerous. Right. And I'm wondering if we're here in Dubois and their right. jobs were to cut down trees. There were deaths. Right. Um, of, of prisoners that actually were, died while working. Right, and, and especially the ones, well, the agricultural, um, some of their agricultural duties were inherently dangerous as, as well as timber. The lumber operation was recognized as being a regularly dangerous occupation. But, and they did, there were deaths, um, and a lot of them occurred because of just normal dangers in, in the forest. Accidents, you know, if you the wind will. blows, you're cutting down a tree. You know, the tree, you know, blows the wrong way and falls over and, and killed uh, two of our um, Wyoming POWs at different, at different camps. And there were um, injuries in the agricultural um, industry with trucks overturning, driving those, those farm trucks and such. But they were considered um, normal, inherent dangers, um, different than being expected to um, work with dynamite. Right. Cheryl, I think our viewers will be surprised that these prisoners were paid. Right. Um, the prisoners were, were paid across, across the United States. Um, what they, did they do with their money? And oh, okay. And what they did with their money is they were allowed to either save it, um, and it was put in an account for them, which was released when, the, when they got out of the camp, or they could uh, use it to buy toiletries and items at the PX at, at the major at the major camps there. Or when they walked to a bar in Wheatland and bought some beer? <laughs> I don't know about that. That's one of the oral history uh, stories that, that were documented. Um, but, but they were paid in script, and they weren't paid in money on purpose for security reasons, just as something like that, where if they, you know, if they escaped with actual cash in their hand, it could be a security risk. So they were paid in script. So um, let's go around Wyoming. Okay. What are some of the camps, the branch camps? Again, there were two major camps. I right. think, I think the, the Camp Douglas at any one time might have had 3,000 uh, prisoners, maybe up to 5,000 total. Overall, yes. And I think your numbers at, 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 at F.E. Warren, Camp Warren in Cheyenne, 900 at any one time, 3,500 overall. Right. But then periodically, these um, prisoners would be assigned to go to these different camps in Powell and Worland and Huntley and all around Wyoming. Right. What did you learn about these branch camps? Well, 
I learned that um, it varied from camp to camp. I think our smallest one was Powell. It was very short term, 44 the, prisoners. The thing about pa the Powell's camp to me is that was at an American Legion building. It was. Okay, now think about that. Yeah. Veterans were at this American Legion building housing prisoners from a war that they fought. The, and that they needed those prisoners, though, to, to work in, in the fields, you know, in the agricultural fields. So, they, again, they were happy to have them. They had worked in Powell before, but they'd bring those prisoners in from other camps, like Camp Deaver. Mm -hmm. And so, um, c continue on, there was, there was Camp so, Powell, yeah. And, th and then <clears throat> um, some of the other camps, um, I'm trying to think of the ones in Southeast Wyoming, um, veteran, um, Torrington, they held larger numbers of prisoners, you know, up to three, four hundred prisoners to work those agricultural jobs. It's interesting to me that you read the press accounts that you document so well in your book, and you have so many wonderful pictures in your book of these, of these, these um, prisoners working side by side with families harvesting their farms. Um, they saved the crop. They saved they the did. day. And they're acknowledged in those uh, annual reports, uh, county and statewide, that they did save the day in, in many towns. In Pine Bluffs, they saved the day. They saved the um, day in the Warland area. And, and, it, and they're acknowledged in those newspaper reports. Did um, locals come to request, I want German POWs because of this, or I want Italian POWs because of that, or? Did well, they have a say in who uh, came to work? No, nah, not particularly. You know, the the army was in charge of the camps. Um, the Italian prisoners were mainly utilized when those earlier camps opened in '43 and into early '44, and then after that, really most of the prisoners were um, Italian prisoners and and prisoners from other. I mean, I'm sorry, German prisoners, mm -hmm. and prisoners from other um, countries. But the prisoners. Um, would go where they were required to go, to the farms. The, the farmers could... Did they just have, the, the families would meet and say, we need help? Yeah. The, Is that how that worked? The families worked with the local extension services and the military, the U.S. military, um, and told what their needs were. And then the amount of prisoners that were sent to each of these farms was determined by, by the cooperative agencies and, and the military, by the U.S. Army. Tell us about some more camps. Okay, so most of the uh, camps in Wyoming were agricultural. Um, there were only, there were 13 agricultural camps and four were timber camps. So the agricultural camps, let's see if I can remember them all, um, Riverton. Yes. Um, and then working up to, um, let's see, Warland, Basin, Lovell, Deaver, Claremont, well mm -hmm. done, I'm looking at a list and you're, you're <laughs> reciting this. So I'm thinking geographically. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, let's see, Wheatland, Lingle, Huntley, Torrington, and Veteran, and then the timber camp, Pine and Bluffs Pine Bluffs, 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 Bluffs. which you had said earlier. Right. And then the timber camps were at Dubois, right. Esterbrook, Centennial, and then a large one in Ryan Park. Park. Yeah. Did prisoners request to go to the they did. Timber camp or request oh, to go oh. to the agricultural camp? No, no, I don't know about that request, but once they got at the camp, they figured out which were the good places to work, which were the better farms where they would be provided maybe with some extra food. Because so. sometimes families literally would they did. cook lunch for the prisoners they did. on a daily basis. And I know um, in veteran, word got out. Word uh, did get uh, out. Uh, uh, but for veteran, one of the um, prisoners who, were, who was interviewed in, in later years by state museum staff, uh, said it was really hard to get to a good camp because the prisoners who had been there longer had kind of established themselves and, and they knew which camps to try to get to and the newer prisoners just had to take where they were assigned. Right. Give me an idea of security. Um, certainly, I, I have to believe they just weren't, the farmer didn't come and pick them off and off they went. There no. had to have been some security. That's right. And th there was always a guard. Uh, sent with, uh, with an the armed prisoner, guard. an mm -hmm. armed guard sure. sent to, to the farms. And as the war progressed, security actually loosened. Once they realized that the chance of escape was, you know, very slim, the, they had less, um, less ratio of prisoners to guards. And actually, after a VE day, the gates at some of the branch camps were actually left open. Wow. 
Well, were there escapes? There were, and I found documentation of at least 18 escapes in Wyoming, most of them from the major, uh, major camps, and a few of them from some of the branch camps. But they were, there were no successful escapes. They were all right. recaptured, and there was only one death. You know, one escapee was shot and killed right. um, that, tr that attempted to escape from Camp Douglas. Why was it, Cheryl, that Camp Douglas prisoners were assigned to these branch camps, but at Fort F.E. Warren, prisoners were mainly um, relegated to base. Why was that? They usually were, and, and I don't know the reason for that. That was um, the only camp in Wyoming where the prisoners were usually kept on, you know, at the military uh, facility. And, and one reason might be that there was enough work for them mm. to do right at, that, at that large facility. You know, we're at the National Museum of Military Vehicles, which will open to the public in May of 2020. Um, I think, Cheryl, that your history just blends so well into the history that will be presented here about a, at, a, at a time for people in my generation seems so far away, yet you bring to life in your book that will be brought to life here. Well, thank you. It's the perfect place uh, to have this interview and to learn more ab about our World War II history. People can find your book on Amazon. Yes. You'll be around Wyoming at different talks. I'm sure that people look. should look out for you there and can visit with you personally about your book. Certainly can. Thank you. Again, congratulations on, on writing a book of a part of Wyoming's history that I think is forgotten until now you've been able to, to have shed light on this very interesting part of our history, Cheryl. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us on Wyoming It was Chronicle. a pleasure to be here. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support.